Baik, uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. It is our pleasure to welcome you to the lecture series uh, with a topic using qualitative research to tackle substandard and falsified medicine quality with the speaker, uh, Dr. Martin Kong. So uh, I would like to have your attentions maybe uh, to keep silence and maybe to turn on the silence mode on your phone because uh, the event will be begin. Okay. Oke, okay. baik kepada teman-teman, Bapak Ibu yang kami hormati mungkin bisa maju ke depan dan juga mungkin bisa dimatikan dulu HP-nya karena acara akan segera dimulai. Ya, siap. Mungkin ada teman-temannya yang masih belum hadir bisa diharapkan untuk hadir segera ya. Siap. Oke. Okay. Okay, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. It is our pleasure to welcome you all uh, to the lecture series with the topic uh, using qualitative research to tackle substandard and falsified medicine um, globally with the speaker uh, Dr. Martin Koch. So I would like to welcome our uh, professor, Dr. Dian, uh, professor Diarati as the deputy dean one, faculty of pharmacy at Pancasila University, and professor uh, Ratna Jamil as the program head for the master program, and also professor UC as the head of the StarMed. Uh, and first of all, I would like to give the floor to the uh, pro to Professor Diarati to give an opening speech. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and greeting all, to all, all of us. I would like to thank to Dr. Martin O. Kopp, the advisory staff of Erasmus University Rotterdam, and the committee who have taken the time to collaborate with the Faculty of Pharmacy, Universitas Pancasila. Next, allow me to express my appreciation and gratitude to the chair of the committee, Prof. Professor Dr. Apotheker Ratna Jamil, and all the committees who have prepared for this lecture series. We are delighted to present this lecture series today with the theme using qualitative research to tackle substandard and falsified medicine globally. I would like to give a warm welcome to the speaker and participants, and I realize that you are fully dedicated to the development of pharmaceutical in Indonesia. The lecture series is principally designed to enhance the application of knowledge in academic institution. In addition, this even enable to the building of a productive dialogue between the scientists in enriching their knowledge. Moreover, the lecture series provide an invaluable opportunity for networking between institutions. This is the first time that the lecture series is held in Faculty of Pharmacy, Pancasila University. We plan the lecture series will be held every three months. I'm pleased to highlight that Faculty of Pharmacy, Pancasila University has established collaboration with Erasmus University Rotterdam, implemented in some activities, including this lecture. We are also pleased to welcome the speaker for Erasmus, who are present to share their expertise to their to the participants. Finally, I would like to thank you for your participation in this lecture series with the hope that it will provide enlightenment for us, especially those who are always involved in research, learning and application of the pharmaceutical field and each of our lives. I wish, the par I wish the participants have very fruitful session, and with that, I declare 
Faculty of Pharmacy Pancasila University Lecture Series are officially open. Greeting from the Dean and hope that this event will bring benefit to all parties here. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you, Professor Dian Rati. Um, so before we start the lecture, I would like to give a short introduction about uh, Dr. Martin Koch. So Dr. Martin Koch is an um, associate professor at Erasmus School of Health Policy and Management. His research focuses on medicine quality, social enterprise, and also the health governance. So um, ladies and gentlemen, without waiting any longer, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Koch, please. Oke, okay. um, ladies and gentlemen, selamat siang, I think is the correct expression in Indonesia. My name is uh, uh, Mato Kok. It's uh, wonderful to be here with you and uh, to meet all of you. Um, I work as, uh, as was told, at the Erasmus School for Health Policy and Management uh, for several years now, and I've been uh, conducting research in a lot of countries, including in Indonesia. Um, and I think my, one of my key topics in my research is ensuring the quality of medicine. Uh, but I also look at access to medicine and the way access to medicine and medicine quality relate to each other. Uh, and I thought I'd start with telling you a little bit about how I got into this research. How I became interested in this field and how uh, it has really inspired me to, to conduct this kind of work. Um, and I understand that half of you will look here, and the other half will look there. So I figured I'll walk around a bit, <laughs> so I get to see everybody. Um, so it was May 2014, and I was working for a small NGO, uh, and we were in eastern, sorry, in western Uganda close to the border with Congo. And I just finished an interview with a medical doctor uh, that we were working with in the program. And a small child was brought in. The child was seven years old. Um, and the child had all the symptoms of someone with malaria. So very high fever, um, severe problems also with movement and also even problems with breathing. So we were deeply concerned and the mother of the child was very distressed. We tried to figure out what was going on. The mother said, okay, my child has this for several days now and we went to the local drug shop. I think it's what you call Toko Obat in Indonesia. And the mother had bought a malaria, a, a treatment there for the child. And the, the person who sold her the drugs had already told her to use a double dose, which was very strange. Why would you use a double dose of the medicine, right? Um, and the, the, the seller of the drugs had said, well, the medicine are not always as strong as they should be. And basically, the, he'd also tried to sell her an injection which makes no sense because there's no injection that you can use uh, at, in Uganda against malaria. But it was a weird situation and the mother was distressed because she knew, she had heard, that there were a lot of poor quality medicine available. There were issues with medicine quality. And the doctor was very stressed out as well because they did a basic test and the test showed that there was malaria parasite in the blood. So clearly the child had malaria. And they already had given her a double dose of malaria treatment. So what was going on? So the doctor was concerned. Is there something wrong with the medicine? 
Is there maybe another disease going on? It wasn't unclear. So in the end, the doctor tried to, had no other choice, because normally what they would do is say, well, let's try out another dose, right? But what happens a lot in, in Western Uganda and also in Indonesia is that that puskesmas, basically, was out of stock. They did not have the treatment available. So the only option was either again to go to the Toko Obat, right, buy another dose, or send the person, the young child, to a hospital two hours away. So that's what they chose. The doctor said, well, let's send the child to another dose because we are not sure about the quality of the medicine in the Toko Obat. And we don't have the medicine on stock anymore. And this was for me really a point where I got thinking about, okay, this whole issue of medicine quality, how does this work? And how difficult and harmful it is at the local level if medical doctors cannot trust the medicine that they prescribe, if um, patients do not know whether or not the medicine work, but also if medicine are not available, uh, and how those interacted. Because the reason that the medicine were bought from the Toko Obat, from the local drug shop, was that they were not available at the regular clinic. Right? So these things were interlinked. And this made me interesting, interested in, in the topic of medicine quality, but also in how that related to uh, medicine availability. Um, so the case shows it's how difficult medicine quality is, right? It's a difficult issue, and also that the consequences can be fatal. If you do not get the right treatment or if the treatment doesn't work, the patient will pass away. And it also shows, because a lot of the medicine in Western Uganda come in illegally from Congo. So it also was, has an international dimension. And it also had to do not just with the technical qualities of the medicine, but also with the organization of the pharmaceutical system ensuring that the medicine are available. Yeah, so all those things came together in that little story. And so since 2014, I've been involved in several studies linked to medicine quality, initially in India and some work in Bangladesh. And then we continued the work in Uganda, also in Kenya. And then we conducted uh, a multi-country case study uh, in Indonesia, Romania, Turkey, and China, and a side project in Afghanistan, and now further work here in Indonesia. So there's a whole range of projects we've been working on. And in Indonesia, we've been working with uh, UPE for several years now, and we have two PhD students. Uh, Amalia Hasnida is sitting over there. She does her PhD at Erasmus. Are doing wonderful work, and also Ambus Berrios Fanda, another Indonesian uh, PhD student in our institute. So please. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but before we go further into depth into the research, I want to take a step back and talk, take a global perspective on medicine quality. Because yeah? I think if you work in Indonesia, you often focus on what's happening in Indonesia. And sometimes it's good to take a step back and look at what's going on in other countries and contextualize it a bit. Now, around the world, about 2 billion people do not have proper access to health care, including access to essential health services. So 2 billion people. And about 2.5 billion people also do not have, cannot afford the basic care that they need, right? And the combination of this is very difficult because this provides a market for people who can sell poor quality medicine, right? If people struggle with paying the normal quality and it's not available, they need to go somewhere else. They go to the unregulated sector, they end up at a toko or what, buying their medicine, etc. Now the medicine market is huge, 1.2 trillion US dollar. And I know because of the rupiah, 1.2 trillion maybe doesn't seem so much, but this is in US dollars. So it's a huge, huge amount of money. And the medicine market grows very rapidly worldwide. Every 15 years, the market doubles. 
in terms of economic value. So from that perspective, I think you chose a very good profession. I think there's a great future in pharmacies. Um, now, what are falsified and substandard medicine? There's been a lot of debate about it. And only a few years ago, the World Health Organization has come up with a definition where they make a clear distinction between what is a falsified medicine and what is a substandard medicine. So falsified medicine is medical products that deliberately or fraudulently misrepresent their identity, composition, or source. So you could say it's produced by, often by criminals who just make medicine appear like they are real. Right? That's one option. It can also be that um, a pharmacist, a toko obat, buys a whole bunch of medicine that are expired, repackages it, and sells it again, yeah? pretending it's not expired. So changing expiration dates, then we also consider it falsified. So, so falsified medical products, they may have no in active ingredient at all, or only a little bit, or maybe something else. There were several companies producing fertilizer who've also been producing falsified medicine, whereby you find traces of the fertilizer in the tablets. It may be something completely different, so there's all kinds of options, but the main issue is that it's deliberately misrepresenting its identity competition, composition or source. It's a deliberate choice. Yeah. Now we also have substandard medical products. Substandard medicine are produced by a regular company who is allowed to produce the medicine, who is registered on the market, but the company does a poor job. So there may be less active ingredients in it, it may also be that the company produces good quality, but that somewhere in the supply chain, the medicine are not treated well. They're not stored in a cold chain. They're exposed to heat or other issues, where the, which as a result, the quality of the medicine goes down. So it can also become substandard in the supply chain. So that's a difficult issue. Because then it's less clear, of course, who caused the, the problems with the medicine. And there was one study with uh, Ibu Mariati from Sinjai, uh, Sulawesi, that we worked with. And she tried to figure out why a set of uh, vaccines were of very poor quality or did not seem to work a couple of years ago. And she did interviews, qualitative interviews. And she followed the supply chain and there were all kinds of issues. For instance, the vaccines were not given always at the right time. So that may have caused the problem, uh, but it, what she also found out that the, the cold chain, the, the freezers that were supposed to be used to store the medicine or the cold chain was actually rented out to fishermen to store their ikan, right, to store the fish. So the medicine were produced or the vaccines were probably of good quality when they were produced, but they were not stored in a cold chain. And that may also have been the cause. So there were several issues going on. And this is typical for, or this, for the problem of substandard medicine. It's often not clear where it became substandard. It's difficult to know. Now, what are the consequences of falsified and substandard medicine? And this is where I need my moderator, sir. <laughs> um, because since you're all pharmacists, or pharmacists-to-be, I'm sure you can tell me. What are the consequences of poor quality medicine? Who has an ID? Ayo, ada yang mau jawab? Angkat tangan, silakan. Yeah. Feel free to raise your hand. Anyone? Silakan. Uh, thank you, sir, for your opportunity. Uh, my name is Nessa from Pharmacist Profession Program. Uh, in my opinion, the consequences of 
uh, falsified and substandard medicine is um, the, the ill people will get more ill and the risk of death is getting higher and also uh, increase the burden of financing in healthcare. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I always, it's very, I always think it's very brave to stand up as the first person, so thank you. Uh, yeah. um, what are other consequences? Uh, one of the medicines that's tested in, a, in this big study by, by, by UPE is amoxicillin. Now, if amoxicillin is not of good quality, it's an antibiotic, what happens? What, what is a potential co consequence of poor quality? Yeah. And yeah, AMR, yeah? antimicrobial resistance. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's another issue. What else? We have yeah, mortality and morbidity. Yes. What else? And maybe high cost of treatment. Yes, because I mean the treatment will be long, very long. And the patient will stay longer in the hospital, and also maybe uh, the, uh, the disease getting worse and worse, and uh, end up with dying. I think. Yeah. So time is an issue, right? And if it's if we talk about an adult, you yes. cannot take care of the family, cannot work, and then the yes, disease. Of course, the quality of life become reduced and reduced. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean the welfare also will be reduced. Yeah. And, and will the person trust the doctor more? I don't think so, because you know, the trust is very important in this case, and the person didn't get any progress, then the trust of the doctor will be lower and lower, yeah. getting lower, yes. And, and since we're at it, what happens to the cost? Well, of course, as I said before, that the cost of the treatment will be increased in, in increase and getting increased and getting bad, because I mean, uh, the disease become uh, so risked and also not safe. Yeah. And I mean, maybe additional disease who will have. Yeah. Yes. And of course, it will it will cause in uh, development of of the payment. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Then the consequence is that uh, the price of the uh, medical treatment also will be high. So pay again, again. and again? Again and again. About either the, the patients, right? The, the person, yes. Or, or BPJS? Uh, BPJS, I mean, will burden so much. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so here, this is what I list. So to throw okay. health, promoting drug resistance, waste of money, mm -hmm. undermining confidence, creating distrust. Okay. And also the last one, right, mm -hmm. sir, is income for criminals which is also something that we do not want, right? So, <clears throat> so there's a whole series of, of, of consequences for uh, poor quality medicine. Um, <clears throat> doctors wasting time, of course, leads to death, do not work as intended, prolonging illnesses. These are the kind of things you, you mentioned here, right? Of course, there's a waste of money from the patient, from the national health system, etc. So, it, so there's a whole set of issues, problems that are being caused by poor quality medicine. Now, if we want to understand the problem a bit bigger, a bit bigger, how many falsified and substandard medicine are out there? What do we know about that? How do we estimate the prevalence? And why is it so difficult at the moment to estimate the prevalence? Why do we not know how many of them are of poor quality? Um, <clears throat> a couple of years ago, in 2013, the World Health Organization set up the GSMS, the Global System for Monitoring and Surveillance. And the idea of the GSMS was that the WHO would basically support countries, and countries would identify, would, would report poor quality medicine to the WHO, so that the WHO could make sure that we carefully keep data of poor quality medicine huh? and that we, if we have to, also make sure that a product is being recalled. So that if a poor quality product is on the market in Malaysia and they find that it's problematic, they can also contact Indonesia and say, hey, 
we find the problem with this medicine in Malaysia. If you also have it in your country, perhaps you want to withdraw it from the market. You need to do a recall. So that was the setup. And so the WHO trained countries, country officers, national regulators, to identify a case of poor quality medicine and then also to report it to the WHO. And if you look at the data of the GSMS, this report is public. You can find it yourself also. You see that basically countries from all over the world have reported many cases of poor quality medicine. So it's a problem that exists everywhere. And a few countries that do not have it here or seem to have it have most likely simply not yet reported. It doesn't mean that the problem is not there. So it's a true, truly global issue. And you find them also in the most regulated countries in the West. People think, oh, it must be fine there. No, we also find this medicine uh, in the Netherlands. So this is a, an article from the Netherlands. And here you see a kanker medicine. I think you use the same word. This was about falsified cancer medicine that were being used in the Netherlands and they discovered. So it's something that happens all over the world. It's a problem everywhere. And the problem is getting bigger and bigger because it's becoming much more easy to produce fake products. And the world is rapidly globalizing. People send uh, products around the world easily, send packages abroad, etc. And so the problem is becoming more and more difficult. And if you look at a map of with some of the, the biggest um, the biggest issues that they managed to get of uh, poor quality medicine. For instance, a couple of years ago in Angola, they found 33 million doses of fake malaria medicine. Now imagine 33 million people being really sick and buying a medicine that doesn't work. 33 million. And that's just the one they, they got. Because there are many, many more, of course, that they did not caught, uh, that managed to ship this medicine and were actually taken by patients who got poor quality medicine. Uh, and you see in other countries as well, 840,000 uh, in China erectile dysfunction. That's a big one. Uh, where in the past, especially, a lot of fake products were produced. Painkillers, antimalarial treatments, psychosis, prostate cancer, weight loss, all kinds of... Uh, medicine are being produced. So it's a big global problem. And one of the issues that we're only starting to see more of it is that we're only recently starting to truly look at it. They say the more one looks, the more one finds. So the more you study medicine quality, the more likely you're going to find, of course, problems with medicine quality. You need people who are aware, you need doctors who are aware, willing to report, you need nurses who are aware, willing to report, you need pharmacists who are aware, willing to report, patients even who can be concerned, right? So the more people we educate about this, the better we can together tackle the problem. And the WHO has trained the national regulators in a lot of countries, and um, you see the blue line is the number of regulators they trained with reporting medicine. And the red line is the number of low quality medicine that are being reported, right? So you see that the more they are trained, the more of them are also reported. And you see that these medicines are reported by a large variety of WHO regions. And basically, so do you know in which WHO region Indonesia is? Does anybody know? I was a bit surprised because you're in the same region as India, but you're not in the same region as the Philippines. So the w so Indonesia is in the Southeast Asia region. And if you look at it, actually it's only very few of the problems are being reported from the Southeast Asia region. Well, you have, I think, about a quarter of the population at least, maybe a third of the world population. So I think there's quite an agenda, a lot of research work to do here uh, to further tackle this issue. 
You see, all types of medicine are being um, are being studied and are, are being found to be problematic. Uh, everything from antibiotics, cancer medicine, diabetes, HIV, malaria, etc. Um, besides that people may not know exactly, they may not be aware of the problem, people are always also not always likely to report it, the problem. Yeah. So I'm going to volunteer somebody. Imagine that this gentleman over here is the director of Pfizer, right? Yeah. Uh, and somebody in his team says, well, there may perhaps be a problem with one of our products. It may be that somebody is producing a fake version of our product, but we think it's only in Flores on the market, nowhere else. It's just a small criminal doing this. What happens, what is his consequence if he says, well, do a product recall, we need to tell everybody in Indonesia that there is a fake version of our product on the market. What will it be the consequence for him? It will, of course, kill his market, right? Once that gets out in the media, nobody wants to buy that brand anymore. So even though it's only possibly on one island, and it's actually not that big, if he does a proper product announcement, it may completely destroy his market. So the factory, the producer, may not be inclined to announce it. They may think, well, it seems like not such a big problem, and maybe it's better if we do not report this to Bepom and we just keep it with ourselves, right? That's what happens. So producers, for financial reasons, or distributors, may there's no incentive for them to do their job. There's actually a disincentive for them. They lose a lot of money if they do their job. So they're not inclined to report. Health workers, it's also not very easy. Even if they suspect something, many nurses, if you're very busy running your clinic, one patient after the other, there's a big line of patients outside, you say, well, there's something weird going on with this medicine, I don't know, but there's the next patient, and the next, and the next. And maybe you want to report it, but where do you report it, and how, and to whom? And then there's a complicated system, and then your boss says, well, you know what, focus on your work, it's not our problem, right? So they may also not always they may even be afraid. Maybe, maybe the pharmacist in the hospital is changing the expiration dates. Are you willing to risk your job by accusing him or her? Not easy, right? And then we have limited data from other sources. The market is huge. Hundreds and thousands of doses are around. Different countries have different standards, different regulations. So it's difficult to know. It's difficult to understand the size of the problem. We do know that custom officials play an important role. They can help when they bust criminals or when people try to smuggle uh, fake medicine. And they have seized small issues, people changing expiration dates, etc. They've also found some large-scale operations, such as the 33 million doses of fake malaria. And what also makes it difficult is that it's a truly global problem. <clears throat> a couple of years ago, there was a big issue in the United States. And there was a medicine that was used to be prescribed for breast cancer. It was called Avastin. And it was used especially in the later stage of breast cancer. When, when your cancer is all over your body, you can be very desperate, and you're willing to take everything, basically, right? And after more research, the government said, well, actually, we do not see the added benefit of this medicine. So we have to withdraw it from the market. It will no longer be prescribed against breast cancer. It doesn't work. But of course, there were a lot of women who had been using it in the past, and there were even doctors who had been using it, and who thought, well, if nothing else works, perhaps we can try Avastin, because they were used to prescribing it. So there was quite a demand for Avastin, even though the government said, well, it doesn't work. Our research shows actually there's no benefit. So there was a market. 
And what happened? Somehow criminals started producing fake Avastin, selling it to patients in the United States. And they did a proper study of how those medicine came into the United States. So the people who sold it in the United States has got it from the United, a distributor in the United Kingdom, who had bought it from a distributor in Denmark, who got it from a trader in Switzerland, from an importer exporter in Egypt, who got it from a businessman in Turkey, and the businessman in Turkey actually got it from somebody from Syria. And the person in Syria wasn't even able to read or write, so used the fingerprint on the contract. So it came through a whole bunch of different countries. Now imagine being the local regulator in the US. Who is responsible for this? Who can you bust? Who should you arrest? Is it the wholesaler in the USA? Is he aware that it's not good quality or that it's fake? Is it the person in the United Kingdom or the distributor in Denmark? Or it's completely unclear. Who knew this was fake? Who thought it was real and just selling it? So from a law enforcement perspective, it's very difficult to deal with, right? Who do you go after? Now, the other most ideal opportunity to study the size of this problem is to conduct a field survey, right? And ideally, you would do a random sample that's representative of multiple areas, etc. Uh, and actually, Panchasila is leading one of such studies at the moment. But that's a dream study, right? Because very few such studies are being conducted in the world. And you test the sample for the active ingredient, for the bioavailability. Is there a sufficient active ingredient in it? And does it do its work? Right? You do assay. Or... But there are not, met, not very many studies that have done that. And especially if you think about the size of the market and the huge number of medicine. So how many medicine are registered in Indonesia? Ibu Yusi, I'm looking at you. Professor, do you have, a, you have an ID? 18,000. 18,000. So there's Dlapan Blas Ribu. Dlapan Blas Ribu. It's a huge, huge number. Can you, can you test 18,000 samples? The big study that, that, that they're leading now is, is over 1,000. But it's not 18,000 samples, right? And then just amoxicillin, you have more than 100 brands on the market. So which ones are you going to test? Which ones are you going to select? And there's a huge challenge there. We have a couple of studies available, mostly into malaria and some into amoxicillin and mostly in uh, only a few countries. And those studies tell us roughly, they estimate that about 10% of the anti-infectious medicine in low and middle income country may be of poor quality. But that's basically what we got. So it's a very rough number. And of course, regulators themselves for their own market have sometimes better estimates, but at the global level, we know actually very little. Yeah. Now, why do poor quality medicine exist? Why do we have poor quality medicine? What is the, the main driver for poor quality medicine? Answer is very simple. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think you, you have mentioned earlier that the why do poor quality medicine exist because there is no access or difficult access to get uh, a good quality medicine. Yeah. I think, uh, I think that's. <laughs> yeah, that's one. Yes, but then that's right. But then you don't have poor quality yet. Why would somebody produce poor quality medicine? Why would somebody trade them? To fulfill the 
uh, emptiness of the good quality medicine. Do you think so, they care for that? Uh, Why do they do it? To make money, right? To get rich. So the big, big driver for poor quality medicine that matters is making money, making a profit, getting rich, right? That's the driver. Criminals do not want to support the people with medicine out of generosity, right? They want to get rich. So producers, use, if they use poor quality ingredients, they do that often because they think they can make more money. Right? If a distributor is using poor quality facilities to store, they do that to make money. If pharmacists change expiration dates, it's not because it's their hobby, they want to make money. Right? And if criminals sell fake medicine, they do that because they want to make money. So the market is a very important issue in this. If we want to understand the dynamic that leads to poor quality medicine, we need to think of the market. What happens in the market? And in general, you could say there are then two root causes. One is constrained access to quality assured medicine, and the other one is lack of good governance. And constrained access has to do with the affordability of medicine, the availability of medicine, and also the acceptability of medicine. Now, the affordability we all understand, right? If the medicine in the regular supply chain uh, that you buy from the upper deck are too expensive, you may go to a toko obat, perhaps where you can get them for less money, or even half a blister, right? So affordability pushes people into the unregulated supply chain. The other issue is availability. There can be all kinds of reasons why medicine are not available. Poor infrastructure, disasters. If you have a tsunami, it's not very good for the supply chain, right? If you live somewhere on a small island in the Plosok, in NTT, Infrastructure is often very poor. It's difficult to get the medicine there. Right? So they're often out of stock. Poor planning is an issue. Rapid policy changes, thefts, manufacturing problems, but also emergencies. Right? Around COVID, a lot of uh, India started export, stopped exporting active ingredients. So there was a problem for Indonesia initially. It would help. We're no longer getting the ingredients to produce the medicine we need, right? Fortunately, people went to the doctor less, so the demand for medicine also reduced. So that helped to solve that problem a little bit. If you look at uh, the availability of medicine in Indonesia, we're now collaborating uh, with what is used to be, the names change all the time, the, the research center from the Ministry of Health, Litbankas, yes, and they split because half of them went to Brin and the other one are in a new center within the Ministry of Health. And, and they looked at, they, they went to visit all 10,000 Puskesmas in Indonesia. And they had a list of all the essential medicine that should be available. And they asked one by one, do you have amoxicillin, do you have amlodipine, do you have etc, etc. And if, the, if you look at the 40 medicine that are most needed, you would expect them that everybody has them, right, as the buskesmas. This is the data. So if you look on average, they have about 60% of the medicine that should be there. This is all buskesmas in Indonesia. The minimum that should be available, according to WHO standards, is 80%, right? So only 2.2% of the puskesmas have the minimum of medicine that should be available. The other ones have a big problem with the availability of medicine. 
So what happens if a patient needs their medicine here? They go to the Puskesmas and the Puskesmas tells them, we're out of stock, you need to get it elsewhere. Sometimes there's a pharmacy, sometimes the doctor owns a pharmacy, right? Or they go to Toko Obat, or the lady on the market, somebody in the Pasa, right? And that's where there's a risk in the supply chain. So one issue had to do with constraint access, medicine not being available or not affordable. Another issue is a lack of good governance. Organizations such as BEPOM have a huge task. Huh? Imagine having to secure the quality of all medicine in Indonesia. That's such, it's such a huge country. All this variety of medicine, right? So it's a tremendous challenge to do that, to, to get it right, with a very small budget that they relatively get. There's, in most countries in the world, not enough trained regulators, not enough, labo not enough laboratories. And it's very difficult to investigate these criminal networks, especially if they're very international. It's very difficult to control this very long journey from the producer of the active ingredient. So where, where are most active ingredients that are used in the medicine that are produced in, in Indonesia coming from? Which country produces the active ingredients for the medicine that you use? China, 90%, I asked this to a, a well-known professor in Indonesia a few days ago, 90% of the API comes from China. Yeah. But how do you know that the quality of the API produced in China is good? Can you trust the Chinese? We spoke to, uh, to producers of the ingredients and they literally, a colleague of us, they gave us the, the list and they said, well, for one, for, for one study, if you are willing to buy ingredients with less purity, it's going to be a lot cheaper. And, you know, if it's for the African market, they're not checking quality anyway. Right? So depending on what you're willing to pay, And that's just a start, right? Because that's the active ingredient. Then it goes to become a finished product. Then it goes into transportation networks, stock managers, distributors, a retailer, a health facility, etc. So the challenge for an organization such as Bepom is, is tremendous. And we spoke to some of the leading uh, officers of uh, Bepom this week, and she explained to us a former leading officer of BEPOM this week, she explained to us that you know, sometimes we, we go to Pasa Pramuka yeah, and we see a big problem yeah, with, with, with one of the sellers. Yeah. So we say this needs to be closed. And we close them down. And we come back one month later. Same shop, same owner, running again, right? So you need a lot of work and you need to go after it. You need to collaborate with other government agencies, which is very challenging. So the, the, the task there is tremendous. So basically imbalances in the supply and demand of medicine and shortcomings in good governance undermine the quality of medicine all over the world. So falsified medicine are produced out of greed, while poor governance, coupled with a limit, limited ability for oversight, allows them to reach consumers. Right? Now, this was my first part. Um, now, I want to continue with a bit more about research into falsified medicine and substantive medicine, and the kind of research that we've been doing. But I know, so right now it's, how long, what time is it? Two o'clock. So you've yeah, been sitting for only already one hour, and if I sit for more than 19 minutes, I get sleepy. So I want you to, please, I kindly invite you to stand up. Let's stand up. Move the legs a little bit. Turn around. 
Say hi to your neighbor on the left. Hi. Hi to your neighbor on the right. Tell him or her to put away the mobile phone and stop playing on TikTok. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And now sit down again. This was a micro, micro break. Um, I'll continue for another 15 minutes, right? Um, so I want to talk about research. Now, I became interested in this issue working in African countries with an organization called Healthy Entrepreneurs. Um, and somebody who I always consider a good friend, uh, Ibu Elizabeth Pisani, she's also been working here and maybe she also met some of you. She was helping a couple of years ago the World Health Organization in writing a report about medicine quality. It was a report together with the DSMS. And she's a great writer, so they said, could you help us write this report? And by the time she was finished, we were discussing this report, and we were discussing the findings, and basically the essence of the report. And what the report had come up with a set of recommendations of what should be done to better tackle poor quality medicine. And usually the recommendations have to do with strengthening the role of the regulator. More money for organizations such as BEPOM, right? And going through this report and comparing it to the previous report that was also written by the WHO in 1999, so almost 20 years before, we noticed that the recommendations were actually almost the same. So for over 20 years, countries around the world had tried to do something, but it seems like there was very little progress. We're still talking about the same issues and the recommendations were still the same. So we thought, well, maybe we shouldn't just look at the role of the regulator. We should broaden it perhaps and also look at others. Look at the bigger picture, look at the market, look at political and economical drivers. And I had arranged the budget and she had arranged the budget and we decided to put it together and set up a study, a, a four country case study into the drivers of poor quality medicine. To look qualitatively in four countries, what are the causes of poor quality medicine? Now, this was really a, a question about what is going on and why are these issues going on? So it was not so much an, a kind of study that you do quantitatively, but it was really qualitative research. Huh? It was about figuring out why are the is issues still the same? Why are poor quality medicine on the market? Why are we not making progress? What is going on? Why do these problems still exist? So it was not just about numbers, but it was also about why questions. Right? Now, how do you answer why questions? You conduct interviews, you analyze documents, and you can also observe, do observations. So this kind of research is not the usual quantitative research that most people are used to. This is much more qualitative research. Interviews, document analysis, etc. And we looked simultaneously at what was going on in Romania, in Turkey, in China, and Indonesia. And Amalia back then was just finished her master's, I think, right? And she was involved, Ibu uh, Elizabeth was involved, somebody who was a Romanian background, somebody who was a Chinese background, and a Dutch-Turkish student was also involved. So we had people from different countries together conducting this research. So we identified relevant documents and read and coded more than 800 documents. It was mostly the work done by uh, the team, right? Um, and then for each case study, 
we selected a relevant interviewees. So it's purposely, purposely selected. So if you want to understand why medicine are still on the falsified medicine are still on the market in Indonesia and what's been going on, who would you talk to? You would, for instance, talk to somebody from Bepom, right? And you would some, interview somebody from the Ministry of Health and somebody from a Puskesmas and somebody. So would you think very carefully, okay, who do we need to talk to? You purposively select interviewees and then you conduct your interviews, you record these interviews, you transcribe them word by word, yeah? and then you have all these interview transcripts, and then you start coding them, marking what are the key segments and what are the key themes that come up. And the team members did that for each country case studies. In total, we interviewed 87 interviewees purposefully selected from different backgrounds for each of the countries. Abu Amalia did that for um, Indonesia. And Indonesia was a very interesting story. Because of course, what was going on in Indonesia, the big change over the past few years was the introduction of JKN, right? A tremendous expansion of the number of people who have access, at least in paper, yeah. affordable access or an insurance card, and should be able to get free healthcare. Now that's great, but what happens if everybody all of a sudden starts going to the doctor, the costs go up rapidly. So BPJS reported quite a budget deficit. So what did the government do? Of course, one of the things they did is starting to push down the prices of medicine, right? And there's fantastic research by Professor Yussi showing how successful actually Indonesia has been in pushing down the prices of medicine. I think for a majority of medicine, the price reduction was more than 50%. So great job to the government of achieving that. But of course, that raises a question. If you push down the prices of medicine so much, what happens to the quality? There was an issue that came up. And Maria was conducting a lot of interviews, and this is an Indonesian quote of one of the interviews. And I'm not going to try to read it out in Indonesian, so please read it. So first the question and then the answer. Yes? So essentially, they say, well, if you push down the prices, companies have got to cope. So they're going to try to produce initially cheaper packaging, perhaps less quality ingredients, storage facilities, etc. They're going to do, in the end, everything they can to still be able to produce. But what happens to the quality? Another study was in Romania. And Romania is interesting because Romania is part of the European Union. And in the European Union, we have an internal market, which means that without any customs, you can, once it's in the European Union, products and people can travel from one country to the other. Now, Romania is one of the poorest countries in the European Union. And the Romanian government, just before elections, said, we're going to have the cheapest prices, the cheapest medicine of all over Europe. So they pushed down the prices very hard. Now, of course, producers didn't like it. So some of them withdrew their products from the market. Distributors also didn't like it. So some of them also withdrew. But some of the trading people loved it because they could buy very cheap medicine in Romania, take them to other countries in the European Union that were a lot richer, and sell them over there. So there were less producers in the market, and a lot of medicine were bought and sold elsewhere. So what happened in Romania? Shortages. Many essential medicine were simply no longer available, including 
very basic magnesium sulfate, very basic issues, but also complex cancer medicine. So patients had to go on the internet, buy off the internet, buy online, and even go to the corner next to the oncology, to the Kanker Institute, the Kanker Hospital, yeah, where there was a, somebody with a suitcase selling the medicine they need. So great risks for falsified medicine. And they also reported a rapid increase uh, in poor quality of falsified medicine, especially on the internet, right? So in Indonesia, you see the dynamic of pushing down prices, which raises questions about quality, but only questions, right? Not answers. And in Romania, we saw the other issue. We saw government, weak government policies leading to shortages. Now we got all this data from all these countries, and then we start to discuss the themes. And we had several sessions with all the research members writing on little papers, little notes, trying to build a scheme of what all the things were and how they were influencing each other. And that led to all kinds of complicated schemes of how different kind of factors would influence each other and how political promises could lead to ultimately poor quality medicine. And we published this in a scientific journal. It's available free online. Yeah, so you can check it out. And that qualitative study was one of the studies that led to another study, a quantitative study in Indonesia. It's what we call the USP project. And that was a collaboration between Erasmus University and University Pancasila. Huh? Um, <clears throat> and basically, this, the idea was, okay, if, if prices are pushing, pushed down so much, does that lead to poor quality medicine? Right, that was the question. So we set up a whole team with several researchers and led by uh, Amalia and also uh, with support from uh, Professor Yussi, they went to the field for sampling. And they collected in total 120 samples of about 50 different brands of amoxicillin. And they went to Jakarta to Bekasi Pasa Pramuka, also to Malang, to uh, NTT, Kupang, especially the area, and also online. And they bought altogether 120, so they visited 400 pharmacies looking for specific brands as a mystery patient. And so Amalia would go in, or Ambus would go in and say, oh, I'm really in need of, maybe you want to explain what you did. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, hi, everyone. So uh, my name is Amalia. So uh, Martin repeated my name a few times. So I, I can see everyone's here. Um, so I've been working with uh, a team led by Professor UC. So um, I. Where's the team? <laughs> like uh, Rahmi, Jenny, and Ayu. Um, from Chepas, from the research center, to conduct mystery shopping. So basically, what we did is we acted like patients who um, uh, tried to buy amoxicillin because our study medicine was amoxicillin, and we were trying to um, buy certain brands um, in those different locations, as Martin showed. Um, and so we're t we're, we went to that uh, to those locations, um, trying to be patients, trying to tell stories about symptoms or uh, our family who got symptoms uh, to get the syrups or to get the tablets that we want. So we went to Pasar Pamuka, we went to Bukasi, uh, all those um, uh, famous uh, medicine market uh, that you would probably know better than we do. So. Okay, thank you. Amalia, because you did it, so it's better that you explain, right? Um, so 120 samples and those were tested. Now, these were the results. On the vertical axis, you see the uh, percentage of active ingredients. And on the horizontal axis, you see the price. Uh, so the cheapest medicine, how much did they cost? About 500? Yeah, 500 rupiah, yeah. 
Lima Ribu? Lima Ratos. Lima Ratos. Yeah, and the, the most expensive one, over 14,000. Yeah, so that's Umpat. No. 14,000. <laughs> yeah, so a huge difference in price, right? That's already interesting. Now, in this study, in the initial results, which need further clarification and interpretation, so we need to be very careful in how we interpret this, uh, at least four of the 120 samples did not have sufficient active ingredients. Uh, some of them very much below the standard, and the red ones. Uh, so they did not work, or there are serious questions whether or not they would work as intended. And three of them were actually dry syrups. Uh, so out of the 10 dry syrups, three seems to have, according to the lab, and we need to be careful in interpre interpreting this, insufficient active ingredients. Now, is there any relation between price and quality? If you look at this graph, huh, you see there's absolutely no relation. You see that there's a very large number out of the normal tablets, only one out of, what is this, about 80, 70? of the very cheap medicine was of poor quality. And even that one was borderline. So basically this suggests that there's no relation between price and quality. That cheaper medicine are not worse than more expensive medicine, right? That, so instead of spending a whole lot of money on very expensive medicine, if you need amoxicillin, you seem to be completely fine in just buying the one for 500 instead of for 5,000. So this shows that Bepom does a, does a good job, right? Because their prime concern, although this was in the private market, but their prime concern is ensuring that people have access to, especially people who have a small budget, to medicine of sufficient quality. And this suggests they, that even the cheapest medicine in Indonesia are of good quality. So there seem to be some problems with some medicine, some products, but overall, there is no relation between price and quality. If you think further about this, so all these people spent a lot of extra money on medicine that they thought of the doctor or the pharmacist told them may be better. But this suggests that's not the case. So they're wasting money for nothing, right? So on the one hand, it suggests there's no relation between price and quality. And you could also think, well, we could save a lot of money, right, in Indonesia by not buying all these very expensive medicine. But of course, this needs to be checked further and this needs to be discussed further with all the relevant parties. So we need to be careful in, in interpreting this. But this is, so far, the suggestion. Now, what I wanted to show you is that, so the qualitative research, whereby we did all the interviews, interviews led as it was an inspiration for then the quantitative research, right? That we did. Which we did all the sampling. And now our next question is, okay, what other studies could you conduct? What would be other studies that you were interested in. For instance, why do these toko obat function? What sustains them? Uh, there's a lot of them here in the area, a lot of them in Bekasi, a lot of them in Jakarta, in the big cities. There's actually very few in Entete. Uh, why is that? What sustains them? How do, what is the influence on the market? But also, what do people think about the quality of medicine? Citizens in different communities. There's all kinds of other questions that you could be asking. And this, of course, you can think of a hundred more, but these are just some ideas. So I hope I showed you a little bit about how, what is the problem with medicine quality, some of the components, some of the key drivers, how that led to, was an inspiration for qualitative research in different countries, and how that then fed into quantitative research here in Indonesia. I, wanna, I hope it was interesting. If you have questions, I'm 
most willing to discuss them and talk about them. Um, and I want to thank you for your attention. And please feel free to contact me. So thank you, um, Dr. Martin. So um, I'm going to start with the discussions again. Uh, I think we can start with the uh, three first questions from. Hmm? Uh, mungkin ada yang ingin bertanya, mungkin tiga pertanyaan pertama, silakan. Oke, okay. siap. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Zainur Rahman. I would like to ask you about uh, how the regulation to report cases about uh, falsified drugs in your country. And then, uh, uh, in Indonesia, you know, uh, if we want uh, the right drugs or a good drug, we must uh, we have to go to apotek or drugstore, the right place to find a drug. But you know the price is too high or too expensive. Yeah, too expensive. Uh, it uh, because of the expensive because about the tax 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 yeah how uh, about your recommendation uh, how you about your recommendation to these cases thank you very much assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh terima kasih um do you want to answer it directly or you want to Get her, yeah, get maybe it's good questions. to directly, right? So, um, so medicine are expensive, right? Um, I think part of the good news of this study and also some of the other studies that are being conducted, our sister projects, is that it shows that expensive medicine are not necessarily better than cheap medicine. Yeah? So attempts by apotec or pharmacists to sell you very expensive versions I think the good news could be that, you know, you can actually buy the cheaper ones and it's just as good. That's nice. A second issue, and that's an international discussion, should we tax medicine that people need? Well, you live in a democracy, right? So if in a democratic country, the decision is made that, that there's a tax, well, um, I personally think it's not a good idea. I think you want to make the price of medicine as low as possible, because it's something that people, especially poorer people, absolutely need. And I think the research showing that in issues, especially in, in entity, uh, that a lot of Puskasmas do not have the medicine they need. They should have. But they're forced to go to a Toka Obat, or they're forced to go to Apotec, even though they have JKN, right? So then you don't want to also put a tax on top of that uh, again. So, you know, I would personally, have my ideas about that, but that's it's a choice in Indonesia that's being made. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, I just want to add, Martin. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, from our finding study in uh, collaboration with uh, Erasmus and also Imperial College, uh, it is definitely we have to go to the uh, to the uh, 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 regulated uh, regulated facilities. Uh, there are some suspicious medicine uh, for the falsified uh, getting from the online. Yeah, getting from the online source, which is it is not regulated or it's not tidak uh, resmi uh, ya. It is not regulated and not registered at uh, at dinas kesehatan. Only people, every people can sell medicine in the online source. There are regulated and unregulated. We can find anything in the marketplace, but in that marketplace, we found some suspicious falsified medicines. Uh, the possibility is higher than the regulated medicines. Yeah. 
Is the regulated, uh, regulated uh, pharmacy, something like that. Yeah. So online is a bigger risk even than uh, Tokobat and... Uh, we have to note that in the online uh, system, there is regulated market and unregulated market, illegal. Yeah. So we, in the illegal ones, the risk of the falsified medicine is highest because in marketplace in Indonesia, we have regulated pharmacy there. If they are regulated, so the uh, the risk is lower than the unregulated. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the the first question is how to re how to report the case if in the Netherlands found some substandard of falsified medicines. Yeah. So. In, in the Netherlands and basically in all over Europe, there is now a full track and trace system whereby every box of medicine is being traced like a package that would you, you would order on eBay uh, or another company throughout the system. Uh, so they can see exactly where each package of medicine is. And when you sell it in a pharmacy, the pharmacist needs to scan it out of the system. And so there's a full track and trace system uh, in the European Union. And I think that helps to secure the regulated supply chain. Uh, the unregulated supply chain remains a question mark, also online. Um, and um, I think the attention so the general perception of the public and also of doctors is that our, all medicine are of good quality. There's no issue. But people do become a bit more aware that actually there could sometimes be a problem with medicine. But I think we're underreporting. But of course it's difficult to know because there's very little research. And because the prevalence in the market is so low, it makes no sense to conduct a random study. Because at the moment we think, well, you would have to sample maybe 20, 50,000 medicine to find one problematic case. So it seems that preference is extremely low, but we don't really know. We don't do the proper research. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, maybe I, I, I can add, uh, it might depend between the developed country and developing country system, right? Because in your developed country is very low, in ours is a uh, little bit high. Yeah, but not, yeah, yeah. But even, even in countries such as Romania, uh, which is within the European Union, we still find big problems, right? And I think some of the, the Malang study here contested Amlodipin. And I found that actually everything was fine. So, yeah. Okay. But in general, yes, you're right. The pattern, yeah. Okay, Stanley, over to you to continue. Thank you, Bu Yusi and Martin. Um, boleh untuk pertanyaan selanjutnya, jika ada teman-teman yang ingin bertanya, boleh angkat tangannya. Oh, siap. Pak Pri. Thank you. Uh, I saw you have a result that of 120 amoxicillin, only four that uh, did not meet the standard. Okay. And you said that uh, there is no relationship between price and quality. I have uh, published uh, an article uh, that found otherwise. Okay. You see that uh, you, are, you you only base uh, the, you know, if if we only see the the quality of the end product, we will find that uh, 
the cheap one is also uh, good in term of uh, the content, uh, the, the the percentage of the active ingredients, and also the what you see, keseragaman bobot, yeah, uniformity, and also uh, the solution. So the end product is fine, but if you do the test further to to investigate the quality of of the active ingredients, like you test the activity to um, microbes to you can find that uh, the cheaper, the cheaper uh, amoxicillin will be worse than uh, than the the pricey one. Okay. And I, I'll give you my 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 article in GV. I have five antibiotics that all five kinds of antibiotics that cheap have lower quality in terms of uh, microbial activity. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I really look forward to uh, reading that. Um, that sounds very interesting. I think this morning we had exactly that discussion about, you know, would it be possible to also look at, uh, uh, to do microbiology and see how well the active ingredient that is in there is actually working. And I think this is also one of the many, many challenges in medicine quality research. And at first you want to look in, there's so many steps that you can look at. You can look at, as, is there enough active ingredient in there? Uh, it should be 80% or 90%. If it's 1% less, is that a problem? And of course, microbiology is then fantastic to ultimately, down the line, uh, give a very important answer. Uh, how well does this work against the micro? Right? That's ultimately uh, very so, so great to hear this. And, and I think a very important addition also to this larger research portfolio uh, that needs to be done. And you're fully right that this is just the first step. And I think that's also why I said we need to be always modest about the findings. Right? And, this and, shows and the other one you might need to check if you have money is the uh, impurities. Because cheap active ingredient has more impurities than uh, the pricey ingredients. Yeah. yeah, that's also, I mean, there's a whole list. Uh, and then first you have 107 brands on the market. Right, and then you have the question: Where are we going to get them? Are we going to sample online, or in the Toko Obat, or in the hospital, or in the Puskesmas? And then the question is: Okay, which tests are you going to do? And and there's a whole range of tests that you want to do, ideally. And one is even more expensive than the other. So this is really so. It's an important. This is a great next step for future research. So thank you for this. Yeah. Terima kasih Pak Pri. We, we see. Oh, oke. Okay. Oke, okay, um, mungkin untuk pertanyaan selanjutnya kepada teman-teman dipersilakan. Yang di belakang mungkin ada yang ingin bertanya? Oke, okay, baik. Thank you. Um if we see your presentation, that's, uh, we are very interested. If we see that uh, the false pro product or drugs, uh, if we influence, uh, how to say, uh, the life of the humans, especially long term. But if we see that in the short term, we cannot see how to the drug influences the the how to say the healthy in in, in, in humans so according to your opinions um, to educate the people in indonesia um, to see 
that the healthy is very important in fact of that we buy something uh, cheaper of drugs so we need something like the education sir, in the human or in the people in Indonesia um, according to your opinions or your experiences so um, what is the methods is very important for Indonesia to implement it in here so everybody like us as students also can uh, contribute uh, uh, such uh, methods thank you yeah thank you I important question right so so how can we engage communities and and, and educate people and different groups around the country in this issue uh, to fight poor quality medicine and and i think um i'm a researcher and i'm always a bit careful in I think it's something that we need to figure out in practice. So I would say it would be useful to try out different strategies and see what works. Because it's a difficult issue, right? Because if you, you don't want to tell people that the medicine that they buy are of poor quality. Because you want them to use the medicine in the right way. So you don't want to create distrust into the health system and distrust into the medicine. So you want to find a way to do it in a very intelligent way to engage them in this issue uh, and in a very careful way. So, so I think this is something that needs really careful, um, locally specific messaging and also really careful evaluation of how you do this best. And it may be that the way you do this in, in Sumba is very different than the right way to do this in Jakarta than the right way to do this in, uh, in Papua. Because this has to do with trust in the government, familiarity with languages, to what extent do you use the internet, do you get your messages from, uh, from mobile phone, etc. So I think this is something that is actually requires, it, it's a very important issue, that, but it requires very careful, thoughtful uh, and intelligent planning, testing, probing, uh, before you roll it out. That's what I would say. So thank you. It's an important issue. Thank you. Untuk uh, pertanyaan selanjutnya, kita masih punya waktu uh, untuk tiga pertanyaan lagi. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, good afternoon. I'd like to ask about differences of sampling between high-income countries and middle and low-income countries. Uh, previously in your slide it is stated that if you want you can maybe remove the mask just for the question mm -hmm. previously in your slide it is stated that in high income countries random sampling is not efficient and therefore my questions are uh, one how come random sampling isn't efficient in high income countries are there any factors that contribute to it compared to middle and low income countries uh, like Indonesia? And the second, what factors that need to be reviewed before conducting kind of sampling and research, especially in middle in income countries like Indonesia in order to achieve efficiency so that the research uh, can be efficient and the results uh, can be used properly? Thank you. Thank you for your question. It's a very important point, right, that you bring up. I think this would bring me back to also the PhD project uh, of Amalia. Uh, uh, but let me take the, I would say Amel, I think is the... <laughs> um, the, the so the, the main issue with random sampling, right, is that you, if the preference is very low and you do random sampling, you need to sample a huge number of medicine to products to just find one of poor quality, right? So if the, if the preference of something is very low, it's better to do even more risk-based sampling, right? So to try to figure out where is the risk highest and at those places where risk is highest, sample your medicine. 
Yeah. So very simple would be um, go online where we think the risk is a lot, lot higher than just go in the to our private pharmacies. Uh, that would be a very simple example. But then even if you go online, you could think, well, probably the very cheap ones might be more likely to be problematic. Yeah? And then the very cheap ones of a very dodgy website. Right? So, so you try to think, okay, what are risk issues, risk factors that help me target the right medicine, the right product, which increases the chance of finding something. And, and the PhD project of, of, uh, of AML is focusing on that in the Indonesian context. So what are, where if you, if you want to increase the likelihood of finding what we say the needle in the haystack, yeah, where should we sample? Which medicine should we select? Because the market is so big, there are so many different products, and you cannot test everything. And so you want to be, uh, because testing is so expensive. And as the gentleman in the back rightly pointed out, first you do assay, you do uniformity, but then also you want to do ideally microbiology, etc. So testing becomes tremendously expensive. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I would leave it there. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mungkin untuk pertanyaan selanjutnya kepada teman-teman, mungkin uh, satu pertanyaan terakhir. Dipersilakan. Satu. Pertanyaan terakhir. Yang di belakang sepertinya belum nanya banyak nih. <laughs> Baik, ada yang ingin bertanya terakhir. Oke, okay, mungkin jika tidak ber, uh, tidak tidak ada lagi pertanyaan, mungkin bisa uh, kita tutup acara pada uh, sore hari ini. Uh, mungkin uh, dipersilakan kepada Bu uh, Profesor. Uh, oh ya, yeah. so thank you Martin for the lecture today. So um, I think we can close uh, with the closing speech from the uh, from Pro Profesor Ratna as the head of the uh, master program. Okay, uh, I think Martin, uh, we already at the end of this uh, lecture. So, on behalf of uh, Dean and also this uh, Academica in the University of Pancasila, we we want to thank you for this lecture today. Nice topic and also good discussion. And yeah, give big applause to Martin and. I think we can do it in the future with the uh, advanced topic and the uh, advanced result of the quality medicine issue globally. Thank you so much, Martins. Uh, I hope you enjoy this lecture today. Thank you very much, uh, everybody, for attending and for your engagement. And also, thank you for your questions and your engagement. That's always wonderful. And I look forward to the next one. Thank you. Uh, so, Dr. Martin, we would like to uh, give uh, something to you uh, as a closing, as so, and, and also to thank you for the lecture today.
papers, right? Okay, so uh, next one we can we can take a picture together. Uh, so for all of the lecturer, kepada uh, bapak ibu dosen, mungkin bisa maju ke depan kita akan foto bersama. Baik kepada Bapak Ibu, terima kasih uh, atas kehadirannya pada diskusi uh, lecture series pada sore hari ini. Semoga informasi yang diberikan dapat bermanfaat kepada Bapak Ibu sekalian. Uh, mewakili dari, uh, panitia dari uh, lecture series Universitas Pancasila, kami ucapkan terima kasih atas kehadirannya pada sore hari ini. Siap, terima kasih.